the three-year anniversary of when my mother died, my 26-year-old husband died of a heart attack. And to lose two people in just such strange and sudden ways, you know, both of them were healthy. They were here one day and, and gone the next. And and to figure out now, what do I do? I'm a 26-year-old widow and I don't have my mom. How do you go back to work and help other people with their problems when your own personal life is in shambles? And people ask me all the time, well, what was that like? And I don't even know how to describe it. It was definitely a really dark and painful period in my life. And one that certainly taught me too, that, you know, one or two small bad habits really hold you back. Hey guys, it's John here with NRSNG.com. I wanted to talk to you really briefly about this interview. If you want to learn more about Amy or her book, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, head over to our website, NRSNG.com slash Amy, A-M-Y, um, and you can find a link to her article, which is free. It's all over the internet. It's been it's been viewed 20 million times or more. It's on Entrepreneur.com, Ian Covington Post, Forbes, Lifehack, Psychology Today, just all over the internet. It's an incredibly inspiring article that will help you and truly help you to, to live a better life and to be a happier person. I'll also post up there a link to her book, which is on Amazon, and I'd recommend if you have a couple extra bucks or if you are looking for something to give to a friend or to read yourself uh, to purchase this book. I've read it, uh, and I'm currently working on many things that I believe are going to help me um, in the future and now to be a better person. Also, you can head over there to find a link to a new course that she's published up on her website. Um, It's an eight unit course and it's titled Mental Strength Mastering the Three Core Factors. Um, It's it's an eight module course that talks about how to incorporate these things into your life and how to find mental strength. All that's going to be up on nrsng.com slash Amy. You can also go to nrsng.com to find our free NCLEX prep courses. Um, that will help you master the NCLEX um, and to be prepared to be an incredible nurse. Okay, those are free courses up on nrsng.com. But more importantly today, I want you to head over to nrsng.com slash Amy to find out more about her and this book and the 13 things uh, that mentally strong people don't do. Okay, this list is going to help you be happier. It's going to help you find more peace in your life and help you define success for yourself. Thanks for joining me today. This is John with the NRSNG podcast. Today, I'm incredibly excited to talk with licensed clinical social worker and psychotherapist, Amy Morin. Thanks for coming on the show, Amy. Thanks for having me. You bet. Amy is the author of the book, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, Take Back Your Power, Embrace Change, Face Your Fears, and Train Your Brain for Happiness and Success. This uh, The title itself has over 10 million results in Google for that title. Um, She's been featured on Entrepreneur.com, Huffington Post, Business Insider, Forbes, Inc., Lifehack, Oprah, NBC, MSNBC, ABC, just to name a few. (laughs) So this is a this is a very uh, it's a topic that resonates so deeply with people. But uh, take a minute, introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about your work. Yeah, I'm a, a therapist. I was a, started um, working as a therapist in 2002 and uh, started writing uh, part-time in about 2007. I started writing a little bit for the web here and there. And then, you know, a few years ago, in 2013, I wrote the article, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, and it went crazy viral <laughs> and um, had the opportunity to write the book as well. So in addition to doing that, I do speaking engagements now, and I um, also teach some college classes here and there when I have time. And uh, write for places like Forbes and Inc. and Psychology Today. That's awesome. Are you, do you do you still practice as a social worker, a clinical social worker, or more just the uh, speaking? I've and... taken I've taken a little bit of a break because um, my you know I didn't set so out much. to write the book, but <laughs> now that it's taken off, my um, the agency I was writing for said, you know, most people don't get a chance to write a book. Since you <laughs> did, why don't you go? Just go because I was really trying to figure out how am I gonna. Stay working all. 20 hours a week at least while I uh, go out and do all this other stuff. So they said, take a break, and then when you're ready to come back, come on back. So I've taken a, a bit of a break to um, go out and, and promote my book as much as I can. Well, that's awesome. I mean, and the book was published about a year ago. Is that right? Yes, just about a year ago, December 23rd. That's great. And I noticed on uh, on Amazon, I mean, this is it's really an incredible book. I, I've read the book and, and listened to a lot of your interviews, and on Amazon it has about 150 five-star reviews. So it's definitely well accepted by, by people. 
Yeah, that's the thing when you write a book and you put it out there and you, it's hard to know, like, how are people going <laughs> to like this or to know, is this good? You know, I wasn't, I never set out to be an author, so it wasn't, it wasn't my um, intention to write a book. So I think, oh, I don't know. And then you kind of hold your breath and then you see the reviews come in. I think, okay, good. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> Somebody likes people it. out there who like it. I can breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> well, it definitely, I mean, we'll get into it a little bit more as we talk, but there were some parts of the book uh, that like, it felt like you were like reading my journal or something <laughs> just because it, it resonated so deeply with, with things that uh, I've seen in myself that are, that are definitely holding me back. So why do you think this topic resonates so much with people? Well, you know, I think it was the idea of mental strength. I think a lot of people just had no idea um, what it what it even meant. And that's one of the biggest questions I get from people is, what do you mean by being mentally mm -hmm. strong? And I think the other reason is that um, we talk so much about what to do. There's so many things about why you should have good habits. And um, I think that part of it resonated with people because I was talking about, well, what not to do with it. It only takes one or two small bad habits to really outweigh all the good habits that you have in life. And so I think for those two reasons, the title certainly had started to catch on because people wanted to know well, what, what are the things that mentally strong people don't do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I come by this list honestly. So throughout it all and through my work as a therapist, but also in my own life, that these were the things I really noticed can hold people back. And so um, it wasn't just something that I, you know, researched for 100 sure. years or really looked at just famous people or wealthy people or something like that, but I wanted real life people and what they go through and what sorts of things seem to help them overcome adversity. And a lot of it came from what I saw in my therapy office, but also in my own life. Do you mind? No, I've, I've read, you know, and, and heard your personal story quite a bit. I know you've shared a lot. Do you mind kind of sharing that again and kind of what led you to, to write this list? Yeah, because it was a crazy thing when I wrote the list and, and it went viral. And before I knew it, you know, I was on Fox News and Forbes was interviewing me on camera and all these things and people asking me about this viral article that I'd written but nobody knew the story and I didn't tell the story if you watch some of my early interviews I really? just say things like well I was a therapist and I, <laughs> I knew these things because nobody knew that I wrote it at you know one of the darkest points in my life yeah. but to understand that um, in 2003 right right after I became a therapist and I thought okay life is good here we go you know um, mm -hmm. I had already bought a house, I'd gotten married, I landed my first big job, and I thought, this is great, I've got this jump start on success, you know, nothing's going to hold me back. And then uh, I got a phone call one day that my mother had been rushed to the hospital, and my mom was 51, she didn't have any history of health problems, so we really couldn't imagine what could be wrong with her, but when we got to the hospital, doctors told us that she'd had a brain aneurysm, mm -hmm. and just like that, she was gone. Hmm. And it really hit me, you know, my mom and I had been very close and it was really hard for me now to figure out how do I go to work and be an effective therapist when I'm grieving this loss. And it was then that I started to become interested in the idea of resilience and mental strength because um, it wasn't an option to, you know, take a year off from work and just go grieve or find myself or anything mm -hmm. like that. I still had to have a job. And, um, and so then... You know, I worked really hard through it all, and I learned a lot about mental strength then, but uh, I certainly had the next opportunity on the, the three-year anniversary of when my mother died. My 26-year-old husband died of a heart attack. Gosh. <laughs> and to lose two people in just such strange and sudden ways, you know, yeah. both of them were healthy. They were here one day and, and gone the next. And and to figure out now what do I do? I'm a 26-year-old widow, and I don't have my mom, and I have to figure out how do I how do I keep going forward and I certainly didn't have the opportunity to to not go to work I took a few months off but I had to go back eventually and how do you go back to work and help other people with their problems when your own personal life is in shambles and and you know I people ask me all the time well what was that like and I don't even know how to describe it it mm -hmm. was definitely a really dark and painful period in my life and one that certainly taught me too that you know one or two small bad habits really hold you back yeah and so I worked as hard as I could to get through my grief and um, was hopeful that someday life could get better. And eventually it did. A few years down the road, I uh, ended up getting remarried. I never imagined that I would, but I met Steve and things felt right and we got married. But shortly after we got married, Steve's dad got diagnosed with cancer. And at first they had said, oh, it's, he'll, he'll beat this. Um, you know, it's prostate cancer. It's really slow growing. But 
within about two or three months, they said, you know, nothing's working. We're sort of out of treatment options. And this was really the first time that I thought, oh, now I know what's coming. When I lost my mother and my first husband, it was so sudden. And I thought, and now how do you deal with this sort of anticipatory yeah. grief? And so it was then that I really started to think, you know, this isn't fair. Why do I have to lose all my loved ones? I didn't want to see Steve have to lose his dad. And um, I was in a bad place. And it was then that I sat down and I wrote this article and published it to the web thinking, well, maybe it'll help somebody else. But really, it was a letter to myself of, hey, ding Mm -hmm. dong, don't do these 13 (laughs) things. And um, so and it was something I needed to keep reading over to remind myself of, you know, if I do these things that they're going to um, really rob me of the strength I'm going to need to deal with it. And and then lo and behold, it went crazy viral. And while all this stuff was going on, you know, 10 million people read it on one website and then Forbes picked it up and 10 million more read it over there. And um, my phone is ringing off the hook. But what nobody knew is my father-in-law passed away within a couple of weeks of me writing it. Yeah. And so it was four days later I was on Fox News talking about mental strength. And fortunately throughout it all, a literary agent called and said, you should write a book. And I didn't even tell her the story at first. Mm. And it wasn't until much later, I think a month later, that I said to her, well, i got to tell you, there's a story, but I don't know if I want to tell the world my yeah. story. I'm a therapist. I listen to other people's story. I don't tell my <laughs> don't own. Tell. And she said, it's really up to you, but, uh, you know, it may give you some more credibility. And so I was fortunate to be able to write the book and tell them the rest of the story um, to know that I didn't just, you know, make this up on a whim. But I it was something that I inherently knew. It was things that I'd lived myself. And um, I'm glad that I told my story now. Well, yeah, I mean, and that like that's what really kind of resonated with me, too, was that. I mean, here you, you were a professional and you, you knew all these things inherently, you know, from your education, your training and stuff. But then you you actually lived through this, you know, and, and you've been through so much more than most people ever experience in a lifetime of, of change and grief. And, and you found this list of things that can that helped you overcome. And I think that and then in, in the book, too, you even go into more detail about kind of this backstory and everything. And it, it really just. Uh, I don't know, it just, it just resonates even more. It makes everything even that much more personal, and it, it really kind of helps me dig into the story more and into this list of things that, well, if it, if it could help you through these hard things, you know, my minor problems and things are obviously going to be conquerable with these with conquering these things, you know? How did you right. de- How did you determine this list of 13 things? I mean, was it was it really, you just sat down one evening, and you're like, what, what what's holding me back right now, or... Yeah, you know, it was one of those, I think I had, had, it was in my brain somewhere. I just never (laughs) written all of the 13 things down before. And uh, it was just one day, I remember coming home from a meeting and uh, was sitting at my kitchen table and uh, wrote this list and it just came to me because people often think there's, there was magic in the number 13. Like, why'd you come up (laughs) with 13? Because, you know, and really, I didn't mean to, I didn't number my page one to 13 and then Hmm. fill in the blanks, but it was a matter of just figuring out well, what are those things that I've learned in my experiences and um, and what is it that I, I can't do right now? And, and that's what I came up with. Again, I didn't imagine that I was even going to – it took a – you know, that later that day I was oh, I could publish it to the web and we'll see what happens. And in fact, the um, a lot of people that read it initially, the reaction was not good. People were really angry. And really? I thought, oh, dear, what have I done now? <laughs> really? That's, that's crazy. Yeah. What, so we can get into some of the 13 things, but what are, from your experience and everything, what do you see most people struggle with of these 13 things? What are like the, the top few? You know, the top few, coincidentally, is the top few right on the list. The first right. one is you know, wasting time feeling sorry uh-huh. for yourself. Um, and it's something that I see often in my therapy office that people come in and they want to tell me all their problems. And while there's you know value in telling somebody your story, <clears throat> it becomes clear after about three or four weeks when they just want to come in and say, and then these bad things <laughs> happened to me this week. And they don't really want to make any change, but they just really want to, you know, sort of justify that they're hosting a pity party and mm-hmm. that they're stuck there. And I do think that that is a big one that keeps us mm-hmm. stuck. And then the second one is about, you know, that mainly strong people don't give away their power. And that's an interesting one for a mm-hmm. lot of people because they've just never realized that, um, you know, blaming other people for how you think or blaming other people for how you feel really does give away your power. 
you know, I, I really like that one. That was, as I was reading that chapter, that was one of the ones that was like, wow, she like, like she, she knows me or something. Like it was creepy because <laughs> <laughs> how do you see people wasting their energy on, on these things and, and, and just eating themselves up with trying to be in control? Yeah, sometimes it's a matter of think of just sort of acknowledging the choices that we have. Because I'll, and I, this is one, you know, again, I come by this list honestly, so I often have to remind myself of it. But how many things in life that we claim that we have to do? And mm. so whether it's somebody says, you know, oh, I have to go eat dinner at my mother in law's house on Sunday, or I have to work 10 extra hours this week, or I have to work overtime. Well, you don't actually have to do any of that. And, to just acknowledge, okay, yeah, there's consequences if I didn't do those things, but it's a choice. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just reminding yourself that it's a choice it can make all the difference in the world. Because sometimes I think we kind of come up with this mentality that we're victims of other people and that they're making us do things. But to just remind yourself that everything you do from the time you wake up until the time you go to bed is all up to you. And if you don't want to do something, you have the power to say no. And granted again maybe there's consequences that keep you from from saying no but you could if you really wanted to and sometimes just switching that or changing the language that you use because i'll hear often somebody will say you know somebody else makes me feel bad about myself or that person makes me so angry just remind yourself again that nobody else is controlling how you feel it's up to you to regulate your own emotions and that that they're not necessarily the problem, but that you can say, how do I shift my life or what do I need to change in my own life to make things better for me? And it's not up to other people or to blame other people for holding you back or dragging you down. It won't get you anywhere. And to be able to really say, okay, what, what do I have control over in my life and what can I change rather than, um, you know, just expecting that other people will, will do that for us. You know, I, I have noticed that just in the last few days, last week or so of, of trying to catch myself saying that like you know catching yourself saying I have to do this or this makes me so upset and just catching that really and, and even if you don't necessarily change what you do or, or where you go or how you you act but just changing the phrasing of of I have to go to work or I, I I'm so you know those things it really it does just change your mental perspective on those things and it helps you kind of approach it in a completely different you know just just accepting that I, I can do or I can not go here but you know, I'm choosing to go there. It really kind of changes the way you see it and, and kind of the, your perspective on the whole thing. Yeah. And I think that often that's just part of the, part of the process is to be when you start to change your perspective and you start to think about it a little bit differently, it can help you feel better. And again, to then recognize that you're in control of your behavior. So whether you do something or you don't, it's up to you. Sometimes it's just really empowering just to remind yourself that, okay, it's a choice and mm -hmm. we're blessed to live in a free country and we're adults. So we have choices over everything we do and it can just be really empowering to remind ourselves of that. Absolutely. There was one quote from the book I really liked too. You said, research shows that it's possible to become so focused on ensuring you'll be successful, you could actually overlook opportunities that could help you advance. And, and how, how have you seen that in, in your clients or in your experience? How, how have you seen that? Yeah, that one's an interesting one because I do see it in people that will say, you know, I, they'll come up with some formula for success in their life and they, they focus strictly on what they think that they need to do. And so maybe it's something practical, like they skip going to do something with friends or family because they think, you know, I have to do X, Y, and Z for my work. Well, then they miss out on meeting new people and you never know where an opportunity is going to hmm going to show itself to you and so I think it's really important to just be to be open or to think you know if I accept this new opportunity at work that's not the path I intended for myself so I shouldn't do that because I really thought I was going to you know mm. go on to do this other thing and and it makes us close-minded sometimes to the things that that can come our way and to know you know what part of success yes hard work is part of the formula but it's also you know being able to notice opportunity when they come your way and sometimes there's a bit of of luck involved in that that you just never know if you sit next to somebody on an airplane or if you um run into somebody you know at the grocery store you never know what sorts of opportunities can come your way when you're when you're open to them but if you really think that you've got it already all figured out and you're headed that way then you could miss things if you don't just look around sometimes and 
you know, for me personally, I never intended to be an author. That was never my <laughs> goal in life. <laughs> I always thought, oh, it would be neat to write a book. But, and then when I kind of look back at how all of this happened, you know, that I wrote articles just to earn extra money after I was widowed and then, you know, things sort of unfolded in a strange way, but, and I'm really grateful that that happened. And I certainly never thought I'd do speaking engagements and that sort of thing. But, um, but I'm happy that all of that happened. But if I had set out on a certain path in life, um, I could have could have missed out on all of this. How do you kind of achieve that balance of of wanting to be in control and having these goals? And then, you know, because coming from someone who who maybe wants to be in control and loves being in control and maybe realizes they're doing that. I know in, in the book you give tips and things, but how, how do you kind of start to achieve that balance of rather than just going to the grocery store to get the milk, like you're going there open, that there could be opportunity here to meet somebody or to whatever it is. Yeah, I think part of it is just to remind yourself on a daily basis of, okay, you know, what what could show itself to me today that maybe I wasn't intending or what sorts of opportunities might I find if I'm looking. And it's a matter of being aware of that and to know, okay, well, somebody calls you and asks you to do something and it's not something that you would normally do to just ask yourself, well, is there something that could come out of it? Um, and cause I see, see a lot of people who are so focused, which is great, but they're so intent on, um, you know, the destination and they forget the journey to get there or mm -hmm. that they're not open to taking a, a sharp left turn sometimes when they're on their path and to know that sometimes that that's okay. And that life is an adventure and that you don't have to have it all figured out, but that, um, just being in the right place at the right time and, and doing new things and getting out and enjoying life is part of part of the journey too that you don't always have to be because you know I think just your example of when somebody runs in the store to grab something that and we do that so often in life we're in such a hurry to do things that it's all about getting things done and checking things off on our to-do list and being busy and to that we forget okay it's not just about how much did I accomplish today but am I living according to my values and am I working towards my goals yet at the same time am I um, open to to new things that would come my way just as you're saying that like being being open to new things and 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 living to your values one of the other items on the list that really stuck out to me and I was just reading it again this morning was that they that mentally strong people don't resent other people's success and as I was reading that, you gave an example in the book of um, that how important it is to have your own definition of success. And what we can fall into the trap of is, you know, I might see a, a high power attorney who's working and traveling all the time, and I might just be jealous that he gets that really cool career. But then I might see a stay at home dad and be jealous of that, too. And how that kind of that dichotomy, of, I, I can't what's my definition of, of success? It can't be both of those. And just living true to my definition definition of success, and how how do we kind of define our success? Because it is hard for me sometimes to see people doing all these neat things and 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 not be a little jealous of what they're doing. Yeah, and I think that's hard for a lot of us, and especially in the days of social media, right? When you can scroll yes. through social media <laughs> and it looks like all your friends are doing really cool things and they have great, you know, things going on in their lives and it's easy to start to think, well, why can't I have a house like that? Or why can't I go on vacations like that? Or I don't have that many friends or I don't get to do fun things. And, and it's easy to lose sight of it. So I encourage you to really sit down and figure out, you know, what, what is your definition of success? What's a, a life well lived? You know, is it more important to you to spend time with your family or how important is your career and how important is it to travel and go do fun things? But to know, okay, you know, in my life, this is what's important to me. And every time you take your eyes off of your own definition of success, it it really sets you back and it can distract you from, from your own goal. So to say, okay, this is my goal and it's okay that that person has their goal and that if this other person is successful, whether it's your neighbor or your sister or one of your coworkers, that it, it doesn't diminish your own success. Because I think sometimes we get caught in that trap of thinking, well, if somebody else has more than I do, it somehow makes my accomplishments seem like they're less worthy or that they're not as good. And But if you can keep your eye on your own definition of success and say, well, this is what I have in my life and I feel good about that, then it doesn't matter so much what other people have. Right. And you, you tell the story, too, of the hockey coach for uh, the Miracle Team, you know, the U.S. Olympic hockey team. And, and one thing that he said was that you need to write your own book of success rather than focusing on someone else's. 
success as, as being your definition of success. And I, I think uh, with the new year coming and everything like that, how do we kind of determine New Year's resolutions or, or our definition of success for this coming year? What's the process of that and how is that different than maybe what we traditionally do? Yeah, I think, you know, New Year's resolutions, uh, the statistics on those are terrible as well that we <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> keep them for, you know, 16 days or something ridiculous like that because I think we set up these lofty goals um, of what we are a sort of idealized versions of ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. okay, if I could, you know, lose 30 pounds and I could exercise six days a week and, and really set ourselves up for failure by coming up with these really unrealistic things that obviously we can't even stick to for more than um, a couple days. of weeks. <laughs> right. Yeah. A couple of days. Yeah. New Year's day. And then after that, you think, no, it wasn't that. I'm yeah. not going to do it care. today. <laughs> right. I can go to the, go to any gym around the country on, you know, January 2nd and then go again on February 2nd and just take a look at <laughs> how things have changed. Descendants and enrollment is way down. But I think to know, um, you know, to not try to set a, a lofty goal just based on the date of a, on the calendar, because I think there's a lot of pressure around mm -hmm. this time of year for people to start thinking, what am I going to do? And mm -hmm. what's my life going to be like? And we ask everybody, what's your new year's resolution? But you know, just because it's a date on a calendar doesn't mean you're ready to make that commitment or that change. And so to really ask yourself, well, what, what am I committed to doing? And that it doesn't have to revolve around January 1st, but to say, what do I want to, you know, what steps can I take to make my life better? And I think that's a, a question we should continuously be asking ourselves and that it's okay for your goals to shift or change a little bit, but to, again, it goes back to what our values are in life, that it's easy to say, you know, I, I value um, volunteer work and, and doing community service, but then you look at your life and you think, well, when's the last time I, I did that? <laughs> um, and so then you say, okay, well, if I'm going to make that more of a priority in my life, how do I do it? And how do I start to incorporate that in my life? And rather than just saying, I'm going to, you know, lose 30 pounds or I'm going to, um, you know, volunteer every day for the rest of my life or something like that to say, well, how do you incorporate your values more into your life so that you can live more according to your values and um, to figure out where does work fall on that list because I think it's easy sometimes for people to say well my family is more important than my job but then when you really look at it they say well it's hard to not you know work overtime because mm -hmm. I want the extra money or it's hard to um, it's hard to do things with my family because I'm so tired because of my work and so figure out how do you how do you make those adjustments in your life and rather than looking at it as a big overnight change but to know it's a a shift in how you live it's going to take time and that there's balance to be had and sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back but to know that that doesn't mean you necessarily failed because mm -hmm. I think so often people say you know again the weight loss one I always go back to that because that seems to be most people's yeah. goal for the new year but mm -hmm. then they eat a piece of cake and they think, well, I fell off the wagon. There's no use in dieting anymore. And they give up completely. And so rather than setting yourself up for a goal like that to say, how do I, how do I adjust my life in a way that will um, help me become the person that I want to be? Sure. And you do talk also in this, in this book about the danger in tying self-worth to self-worth to an ability to succeed. Uh, so can you talk to that? What, 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 what is self-worth and how do we develop self-worth? Yeah, the self-worth is really about, you know, how like what's my value in life and what when do I feel valuable or what sorts of things make me feel valuable? And for some people, their self-worth is equal to their net worth. So if they mm -hmm. have X amount of dollars or a certain amount of possessions, then they say, okay, I'm worthy. But of course, the problem with that is, is there's always going to be somebody with more money. And then mm -hmm. when they look at that other person, they think, well, maybe I'm not as worthy as I thought. Or for some people, it's really about their accomplishments. If I get straight A's, then I'm worthy enough. Or if I am climbing the corporate ladder at, at the speed that I want, then that means I'm worthy. But all of those sorts of things, there's a lot that we can't control when it comes to those things that sure. you can't, you know, if your company crumbles or somebody else is better than you, you can't control your competition. And so it's really about figuring out, well, what really makes me a worthy human being and most of us, I think it goes back to our character. Are you a nice and a kind person? Are you smart and somebody who works hard? But can you also acknowledge that maybe getting all A's on a test doesn't necessarily define who you are? Mm -hmm. But um, And so I think it's really a matter of just taking a look at that because I think for most of us, it's really easy sometimes to to say that our self-worth is really about who we are, but then it's really easy to get caught in the trap of then 
um, really thinking it's all about these external things that we don't have a lot of control over. But it really needs to, in order for us to really feel like we're worthy, it has to come from within of who we are as a person and not what we do or who we know. Absolutely. I mean, I think I myself, and I think probably a lot of people fall into that trap too, that we're, we're kind of taught, in, and maybe in society too, we're kind of taught that you're you're successful if you get good grades in school, you go to college, get a good job, you know, and so we kind of start tying who we are to these external things, and you're right, I don't think we do have a lot of control on that, and I think it's really hard for, for me, especially probably to sit back and to say, okay, what what are my values, what are the things that make me a good person, and I definitely lose sight of that often and I I start to look at these other things of okay how many how many people are coming to my website and that makes me valuable you know and and, and they aren't really things that I have control over you know so yeah I'm gonna definitely sit this month and then really just kind of start thinking about the who am I and what's making me a valuable person etc yeah and you know and you bring up like a website there's a lot of research these days coming out too about how for a lot of people, their self-worth is all about how many likes or shares mm-hmm. they get on Facebook or, you know, how many Twitter followers that they have that somehow we think that that is, you know, the epitome of, okay, I'm, I'm okay if I'm my cheated. friend like my photo, <laughs> right? And then when you step back and you think, well, it's ridiculous, but yet it's something I think all of us fall prey to sometimes is thinking that somehow that, you know, whether people liked your family Christmas photo, that that's somehow equivalent to how worthy or how great of a person you are you know and you did you shared a uh, research article about facebook and kind of that uh that process and how how yeah if you get you can look at a friend on facebook and on their birthday they get 300 people telling them happy birthday and and, and that alone can make you feel less worthy or less valuable and i i definitely have seen that in myself for sure you know if, if i post something that's really important to me and, and no one likes it it's like well man i thought it was a good thing but maybe it wasn't you know Right. And, you know, that, yeah, I love the research that's coming out on social media because I think it's a, a really um, interesting way for us to start to uh, really keep track of the odd things that we do in life when it comes to our, our self-worth and our relationships. And the research is pretty clear that social media makes us feel worse about ourselves and that we tend to resent other people when we become envious and and it leads to depression. Yet at the same time, so many people just can't stop you can't stop no, it's... Their Facebook feed. <laughs> you think well how odd is that something makes you feel worse and yet you just you keep doing it anyway so I think that's fascinating that that's where we are in society <laughs> isn't it I mean and a lot of times it's people that you haven't even had contact with in 15 20 years and still for some reason they're clicking a, a thumbs up on your Facebook page brings you value that's it's crazy. right <laughs> it's crazy um, I wanted to talk really quickly about uh, the difference between mental strength and mental health. Um, how do you define mental strength and how is it different from mental health? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, mental strength is really about um, regulating your thoughts so that you're not thinking overly negative or overly positive and it's about managing your emotions so that you don't just feel like you're um, emotions are controlling you and then it's about choosing to behave productively despite whatever circumstances you find yourself in and because sometimes when people aren't thrilled that I wrote a book about um, mental strength, it's often because they think I'm referring to people um, that people are mentally weak or if you have a mm. mental health problem, you're um, less than. But really being mentally strong is all about the choices that you make every day and saying, OK, I'm going to choose to um, work towards self-improvement and becoming my best self. And I try to explain it to people that just because you have depression or an anxiety disorder, you can still make those healthy choices for yourself to become stronger and the best analogy I can come up with is if somebody had diabetes they could still choose to become physically strong and Mm -hmm. work out in the gym and maybe they'd have some complications that would make it a little more difficult for them to feel like they were um, building as much muscle mass as they wanted but it would still be about the daily choices that they make for themselves and mental strength is the same if you have a mental health problem it can complicate the process but it's still about the choices you want to make every day. And even, I mean, as I read through the book and, and identify some of the areas that I feel like I, I could probably work on and, and get better about, um, there can come like maybe a, a slight flood of a little bit of depression. It's like, man, I didn't, I didn't realize I was so bad at this. How is it okay to have those moments of like depression or, or, or feeling down and st- are, are you still mentally strong or how does that all, like as, as I read this and identify areas, is it okay for me to feel down or how do I 
combat that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that we all have times that we that we feel down and we think, you know, I'm a loser, I'm a failure, I'm not very good. And and it's just a matter of then what you do with that when it happens. So when you feel down to say, well, what can I do about this? And, and that can be part of being strong is saying, how do you deal with those uncomfortable feelings? And how do you deal with those thoughts that are really, you know, overly harsh or critical? It's not that you, if you have those things going on, it doesn't mean that you're not mentally strong. It's just a matter of, well, how do you combat those things when they happen? And, you know, for me, after writing this book, people will say, well, you literally wrote the book on mental strength. You must be happy all the time or <laughs> something like that. Like, oh, no, no, no. Nope. <laughs> you know, that that uh, all of us humans deal with lots of this stuff on a daily basis. But it's just really about the choices that you make every day and the way that you respond to, to those um difficult things that you encounter, whether it be external circumstances or feelings or the thoughts that you have. Sure. And so as, as I, as I read through the book and, um, identify maybe the ones I want to work on, would it, is it better to kind of read the book straight through or kind of pick, pick one that I want to work on, give it a few weeks or a few months, or, or do I kind of just pick out the ones I think I really should work on and work on them all at the same time? What's the best way to kind of, uh, attack the book? Well, you know, I encourage people to read the whole thing because for a couple of reasons. One is sometimes people will say, oh, I didn't think that that was a problem for me. But then when I really started reading, I thought, oh, I do Dang some it. of those things. So I think that that can be helpful. But but then I also think it's helpful to read the chapters that that you know, okay, I've got this, that I this isn't a problem for me. Or I used to do that and I've gotten better. To give you more confidence about, okay, I don't, I, that's something that I is really a, a strength for me already. Um and just because it's not a problem for you now also doesn't mean it might not be a problem next year when life changes, you know, yeah. it's happy to, mm-hmm. it's easy to be happy for your neighbor who just bought a new car when you drive a nice car. But what about when your neighbor drives a nice car and maybe you're driving an old clunker or something sure. like that too, yeah. but just recognize when life isn't going well for you, then what sorts of things may crop up. And then to know too, that you don't, have to work on all of these at once but to maybe pick one thing that you want to start working on at a time and to you know pay attention to the other things but to know you're not going to wake up tomorrow and say I'm never going to do those 13 things again and um and that it will be a magical experience it's really a work in progress and for people to know again building mental strength is a lot like building physical strength it's an ongoing thing and that if you gave up going to the gym because you said I'm physically strong enough eventually your muscles would grow weak again and it's all about saying how do I become a little bit stronger today than I was yesterday sure so uh, our, our audience is primarily nurses and nursing students and we get a lot of emails from from them and, and a lot of times it's kind of similar things uh, two of the complaints that we get most often from nursing students is well one is that that more experienced nurses as nurses are as new nurses are getting working on uh, the floor and going into the hospital and working there's a tendency of older or more experienced nurses to really kind of attack their young they call it kind of eating their young where they kind of um, will give a harder time to newer nurses and and things like that how can a new nurse kind of deal with that or, or what what which one of these things could they kind of look at to help kind of combat that yeah I think one of it is just to recognize other people's value. So if somebody's been there a long time, they probably have lots of knowledge and wisdom that, and experience that you don't have, but also for the um, nurses that have been there a long time to know that the younger nurses too have some fresh knowledge and probably fresh energy coming into the building and just acknowledging what other people have. And then to say, okay, but at the same time, even though this person adds value, I don't have to give away my power. So if this person insults me, I don't have to, um, let it ruin my day or I don't have to um, waste a lot of time complaining about people that um, that maybe aren't on board or that um, don't particularly enjoy my company (laughs) because it's easiest way to give it to give away your power is if you know you have a a crabby nurse who um, makes a shift more difficult if you're then find yourself complaining about that nurse in the break room or um, outside of work you're complaining about that person that just gives that person even more power in your life so to say okay this is how it's going to be, then what can I do to do my best? And you can only control choices you make and your own attitude and to not worry about somebody else has a bad attitude. It's not necessarily anything you can, you have any control over. Absolutely. I would love to dive into that more run out of time, but I do love that uh, idea of giving people power because I've done that in my life and it's, it's, uh, 
you know, it, I've done it to the point of it allowing it to really guide my life in, in a way it shouldn't go. You know, you give people that control and it starts to eat you. And it really starts to control almost everything you do as you focus on how upset you are with somebody. Yes, it's amazing how that can really take over and invades the way you think and what you're talking about and how you feel even when you're not at work, all those sorts of things. And so it's a matter of figuring out how do I take back my power. Absolutely. The the one other thing we get a lot of people asking about, and this uh, this probably applies to a lot of different industries and stuff too, but when nurses come into nursing school, they're generally used to doing very, very well in school, you know, in all their undergrad work or whatever. They, they're straight A students. They're very brilliant. They come into nursing school and it's a whole different ballgame and they go from straight A students to D students. Um, which how, how can they deal with that? Which of these 13 things could they use to kind of deal with that uh, kind of change in, in, in grade? Yeah, you know, I guess a couple of them would be to um, not to focus on what you can't control. You can control how, how much you study for a test, but you can't control how hard the test is. And to not compare yourself to other people. So if the person next to you did get a, a B plus and you got a C minus, that it's not, it doesn't mean that you're any less than you were before, but to know that that's okay. And to sometimes just remind yourself of the facts of how many people applied for nursing school versus how many actually yeah. got in versus how many people are actually doing this. And it's a small percentage of the population. And so even if you were the, um, had the worst grades in the class, you're still smarter than, <laughs> you know, how many percent of people on earth. Sure. And so I think, you know, just sometimes to bring it into perspective of, okay, it's okay if you get, you know, if you're not a straight A student in nursing school, you're still doing just fine. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one last thing I want to ask you real quick before I let you go. Um, there, there seems to be a big stigma on visiting a, a clinical social worker and, and talking and ha getting psychotherapy and things like that. You know, we just have in our society this, this, you know, it's a bad, you, you must be screwed up. You know, you must have a mental health issue if you go to a psychotherapist. Um, for people that, that might read this book and might think, well, I could really use somebody to talk to about this, or, or they don't have the support in their life to maybe talk with somebody about these things, or even for someone that just thinks they could use extra help with this, can you talk about, you know, the, the importance of psychotherapy and, and how to maybe let go of that stigma and, and everything? Yeah, you know, the statistic is 17% of people are expected to be performing at their optimal mental health. Wow. But if you were to ask a room of people how many people are performing at their optimal, probably 98% of people would say, oh, yeah, that's me, right? But, uh, you know, statistics show us otherwise. And so, you know, to just know that you – it's not just for mental illness. It doesn't mean that you're you know, particularly sick or that you have a lot of problems, but that you can just go to talk to somebody to say, hey, how am I doing, and, and that – that's a, I mean, who couldn't benefit from that? And that it's really a sign of strength when you say, okay, I could use some help with this and I want to, and I want to become better. The fact that, that there is a stigma associated with that. And you think about it, it's just ridiculous. If you went to see your doctor because right. um, you hadn't been feeling well, nobody's going to judge you for that. Yet at the same time, um, it can be so much harder to say, okay, I'm going to go talk to somebody about um, some problems that I'm dealing with. And that's unfortunate. But I think to know that, um, that in the mental health field, you know, we just really enjoy having people of sort of on the wide range of spectrums and people that really have serious mental health problems, but other people that are doing pretty well in life, they're just saying, Hey, I'm struggling in this area. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. Um, that, that it's okay. And, and to know that sometimes it's just a matter of checking in with somebody for a couple of times and to get some ideas, um, to help you stay motivated and, um, to, help you make sure that you're on track. Sometimes that's all people need is to just meet with somebody a couple of times. And um, I really hope that someday we'll become more like a um, primary care doctor that everybody mm -hmm. would just have a checkup once a year or something like that, or that you could go in for just an, an occasional appointment versus feeling like, okay, I, you know, I have a shrink that I see every week <laughs> for 10 years or something like that. Well, and that's what I even just, I guess I didn't understand it completely either. Cause even as reading your book, some of the stories that you share are, you know, I had this patient who came in for three visits and that was it, you know? And I was like, I didn't, right. I didn't realize that was really something that happened really. Yeah. I think that's the direction that we're going is really, it's, you know, you don't really have to have a therapist for life or anything like that, but that um, sometimes there's different seasons in our life. If you talk to somebody a few times and then went away for six months and you hit another bump in the road that you could then call that person back and mm -hmm. say, Hey, can I come in to talk to you? And, um, 
and go in for maybe a couple more visits, but that you don't, it doesn't have to be something really intense for, you know, years on end or anything like that. And I think, like you said too, I'm, I'm assuming it's a lot like, um, uh, physical health care too, where when a patient comes in, we're not judging that patient. Like we, we legitimately want the best for that individual patient when we're dealing with them, but it's not like we go home and, you know, we're like, oh, that person was so screwed up, you know? And I'm assuming social work is probably a lot the same way where it's like you, you legitimately care for that person, but it's not, you're not judging them. You're not uh, thinking they're a bad person for struggling with something maybe you haven't struggled with. Yeah, absolutely not. And we've heard it all, you know, when people come in and, oh, I'm really embarrassed or, you know, it's really hard for me to tell you this, but usually we think nothing of it because we've heard, you know, a lot of interesting stories. But when, you know, and I tried to never forget what an honor it is that people come in and tell me things that maybe they've never told anybody in their life. And sometimes there's shame around that or embarrassment, but to know that, yeah, we absolutely aren't judging. We just want to, you know, I'm, I'm just honored when people are willing to do that. And I'm just in, impressed by their courage and their bravery to come in and do that. And I just want to figure out what can I do to help you take the next step and to become the best person that you can. And no matter what you've done or what you've been through, that that's okay. It's all about what, what choices are you going to make from here on out and how can we help you with that? And I think a lot of times getting that in the open, you know, having, having all those feelings and things in the darkness kind of probably eat at your mental strength, you know? Absolutely. How would you just really quickly, I know you're, you're, you're short on time and how, how would you recommend someone find a, a, a psychotherapist that would work with them? Is it okay to interview some or how do you find one that would really click with you? It is, you know, sometimes you can ask a doctor and they'll give you a list or, you know, some, depending on what kind of insurance you have, there may be some um, stipulations, but um, yeah, the one thing we know is what works um, no matter what kind of therapy somebody uses or what their education is. It's really about the relationship and feeling comfortable mm -hmm. with somebody. So um, sometimes people will have in their head, you know, I want to work with a, a female or a male mm -hmm. or, um, you know, I, I need somebody that's older than I am in order to feel confident going through sure. the door or whatever it might be. But, but that it is okay to call. Most therapists will give you at least 15 minutes over the phone without mm -hmm. charging you any money to just say, what kind of questions do you have? And mm -hmm. And from that phone call, you may get a sense of whether or not that's somebody you can work with. Um, but certainly if you meet with somebody for a session or two and something you're just not comfortable, you can always ask to be referred to somebody else. And we don't, we don't judge or take offense to that at all. I would much rather somebody has somebody that they're completely comfortable with. If they're not comfortable with me for one reason or another, I'm happy to then give them some options of other therapists that I know or people that may be a better match. Okay. Awesome. Amy, thank you so much for all your wisdom and things. This book really is uh, helping to kind of shape my journey going forward. And I, I really appreciate it. And I really suggest everyone check it out. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Where can people find you and, and, and everything? My website is Amy Morin, M-O-R-I-N. LCSW is in licensed clinical social worker.com. And on there I have information about my book and a new e-course on mental strength that I just launched and I have a blog and lots of other information and resources. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Amy Morin. If you do want to learn more about her, please head over to nrsng.com slash AMY and just Amy, right? And I will post up there links to her book, to her article, to her course, and more about her. It was such an honor to interview her and to talk with her. Um, this will just help you so far beyond nursing and nursing school. This is going to help you in life. And I'm just so grateful for her for coming on the show and for talking with her. I felt like I had my own personal uh, hour-long session with the psychotherapist. So um, I really appreciate her. And she just gave me a lot of... Um, ideas and thoughts and things about ways that I can improve my life. And if this episode helped you even the slightest, I want you to head over there and check out the article. And I also want you to just share it with somebody, okay? Just right now on your phone, pick it up and push the share button. Send it as a text, email, whatever it is, so that you can help somebody else find uh, the peace that I know you're going to find um, and the happiness, right, that you're just going to, that you're going to find after um, this episode and after reading this list and, and checking out her book. All right, guys, I hope you have a wonderful day. Um, and if you need additional help with the NCLEX or with nursing in general, please head over to nrsng.com. 
Okay, we have so many resources out there for you, many of which are free, um, and I just I want you to succeed. That's what this is all about. Okay, this is about your success um, and you enjoying this process and this journey uh, in nursing and in nursing school. Okay, so we'll talk to you soon. Until then, we'll see you.